Let me ask you, Alan, let me ask you briefly, if, if uh, John Glenn had not gone on to politics and become uh, a Democratic senator from uh, Ohio, do you think he'd be here today? Uh, I think it's quite possible. I think it's quite possible that NASA would realize that we have to start sharing space with people that aren't pilots and scientists. And he's the perfect person to go. He's old. He looks old. I love that part about him. <laughs> he, we shouldn't send him if he didn't. And he's going to be able to go up there Speak and have a great... Speak <laughs> <laughs> All right. He's going to go up there. He's going to have a great flight. He's going to come back. We're going to... He's going to raise the bar for people 66 like I am and say, I can do more. Look at him. Absolutely. There's the famous van which uh, sends the astronauts on their three mile or so trick, trip out to launch pad 39B. It is standing by outside the operations and checkout building where those suits are being tested. Back to the launch gantry we go where the final inspections are taking place in preparation for the crew to arrive. Uh, Alan, you know, as we look at a shot from the Goodyear blimp here, the crowds, everybody keeps saying this is like an Apollo moonshot of some kind, given the crowds and the overall atmosphere. Would you concur with that? I would concur, definitely. There's more excitement than I've seen in the air since Apollo 11. And people care about this. They care about it. I speak frequently. I'm around the country. I've not went, met one single person that didn't think this was a great idea. I usually then say to them, would you go? I'd say about a fourth say, I'd love to go. Yeah. I'm sure they would. Well, what about those, uh, Alan, I'm sure you've heard it, maybe not directly, who say it's a very risky stunt on the part of NASA to do this, and the science is merely a way of uh, trying to, to cover that fact. Well, we, first of all, we don't think we do stunts, so we're very careful about that. We don't want to do anything that's a stunt. All we want to do is minimize the risk to make the progress we can make in this wonderful field of space so I'm sure that everybody there feels that way wants to make it as safe as possible but it isn't without risk but he's ready to take it and many people would would welcome the chance to to go make this uh, how do you feel about it Walter if someone approached you oh I if, if they came up here now I'd walk out there and get on. That was, <laughs> that's what without, I mean without a suit for <laughs> so you're, the backup. Right. you're John Glenn's backup today. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Oh, of course. Uh, uh, you know, every red-blooded American, I should think, every red-blooded yes. human being would want to get up there. I, uh, I can't imagine anything with the, the thrill of the flight, but also All right, we're being looking, able to Walter, look at I'm this sorry, i got to interrupt was. briefly. That's the President and the First Lady heading to Marine One, south lawn of the White House, uh, their ultimate destination, Patrick Air Force Base, about 10 miles from where we sit, and ultimately to the roof of the Launch Control Center, to witness this launch. Go ahead, Walter. I'm sorry to interrupt. Maybe with the with the circumstances today, he'd like to go up. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's going to be a great experience for both of them. There's nothing like being here compared to looking at it on TV, don't yeah. you think? Yeah. And of course, we're going to have, right. yeah. have an exclusive yeah. interview, 1 p.m. Eastern, with the president. Well, it's like everything else. The, uh, the the view from by television is always better than actuality. I mean, we are here two miles, three miles away oh, from this thing. You're going to see those close-up pictures of that blast, and then you're going you're, you're going to feel more like you're aboard that rocket than we are sitting here watching it uh, live. It, ha it has some emotional component about the noise and the fact yeah. it leaves and the smoke and the excitement and the risk. Yeah. It's part of the feeling of elation when it works. It just, I don't know how to explain it, but hes I'm glad the president is coming with the first lady. They're both going to yeah. be a little bit affected by this. Right. We should point out uh, the mission uh, clock now stands still at uh, T-minus three hours and holding. We have, I think, about 15 minutes left in that built-in hold. That's a perfectly routine uh, thing. It's a two-hour hold, which uh, is built into the whole uh, concept of a countdown here at NASA. The idea is to give the crews an opportunity to catch up on work, which may have spilled over. It gives, gives them benchmarks in time. Sometimes, however, Alan, I wish they'd just set the clock and keep it simple. <laughs> yes, they would, but we learned that we can't keep it simple with something that complex. But, you know, we were seeing a few minutes ago in the suit room getting suited up. I can remember going out to both of my missions. You leave there, and you've got a little blower that uh, cools you off. And you, it suddenly gets quiet. No one's talking to you. Everybody was around them there. You get in the little van. They connect you up, but nobody says anything. It's so quiet. Nobody knows what to say. You're just sitting there. It's too early to wish everybody good luck. At the same time, you're getting to go on a great adventure. And I remember getting out the launch pad and riding the elevator, and I thought, where are all these people that used to be here? There used to be two or 300 working on it. We saw some a minute ago. They won't be there. The crew's going to get out there, and they're going to be wondering why they're the only ones there. Tell me, as Space Commander, uh, what, uh, 
what for your last words before blast off internally on the internal communications to your crew well i was just asking that all of us could do the best we could do i think the fear among astronauts as you pointed it out earlier about yourself walter is that when the, if something comes up where you need to know what to do you, that you learned in training you hope that you can remember it you know there's a lot riding on this not because people are watching but because this represents the united states of america and you feel that sort of thing i felt it walking on the moon and you you think i hope i can do it and, and then finally you fall back and just say i want to be able to give my best effort i want to be able to do the things that i've been trained to do that's all you can ever ask on something i'm sure that's john's thinking like you said he wants to do what he was supposed to do and do it well. All right, let me break in. We have uh, live pictures of the president's helicopter, Marine One, as it lifts off from the uh, south lawn of the White House. Uh, he's headed over to Andrews Air Force Base, short chopper ride away. On to Air Force One, he comes, and southward he heads. We should be seeing him here about 12.15 p.m. local time. That's Eastern Standard Time. And with that, uh, we will leave you with the clock holding at three hours and soon to resume in about 20 minutes, live from the Kennedy Space Center. Miles O'Brien, along with Walter Cronkite and Alan Bean. Stay with us. Live pictures from Titusville, Florida, about 10 miles due west of the Kennedy Space Center. A picture-perfect day for a rocket to blast into orbit, and uh, it looks like certainly the weather is 100%, and so far, knock on wood, the orbiter is as well. Walter Cronkite's with me here, and uh, we're counting down to launch. Right now, we're at three hours in holding. It's a planned hold. You know, uh, an interesting thing is that we talk about the weather here, which we can see is absolutely beautiful, gorgeous. But a consideration always is where the, what the weather's like at the possibly abort landing mm -hmm. sites. Mm -hmm. If things go wrong on the launch, the, the spacecraft has to get back down. They've got these uh, positions along the path uh, of the up to orbit where they can go in for landings in Africa particularly and uh, in, in Spain. Uh, the weather has to be good there as well. So apparently, from all of our reports, the weather is good around the world for this flight. Yeah, it's, the, the gods are shining upon us, I think, Walter. Um, you know, I know you've heard uh, John Glenn talk an awful lot about his hometown. He talks about New Concord an awful lot, his yep. formative years there. I think it has a lot to do with his personality, doesn't it? Well, he's it? one of those rare people who spent his whole life there. I mean, well, he's born nearby, moved to New Concord as an infant. Had nothing to do with the decision to go to New Concord. But, uh, but he, he has never left there except to, to go around the world a few times and uh, set speed records and be in the Senate for 24 years. But except New Concord is still his home. <laughs> it was uh, there that he met uh, Annie, uh, his uh, wife, Anna, who uh, uh, they, they, they say they met in the playpen. I have heard They've that. They've known each other since they babies. Old family friends. 